Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know in nuclear or science, but I can certainly share some knowledge. If you like this video, please hit the like button down below, and go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this coming. If you didn't like the video, please leave me a comment down below and leave me a suggestion on what to do better. I'm always looking to improve. Today we're going to be looking at another Curse Gazette video called How to Terraform Mars with Lasers, in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> this was another video that was actually requested by me. I've been getting a lot of requests lately to uh, look at Kurzgesagt stuff, um, so uh, thanks for the suggestions. If you have any more suggestions, please let me know down in the comments. Let's get started. Mars is a disappointing hellhole lacking practically everything we need to stay alive. It looks like we'll only ever have small crews spend a miserable time hidden underground. Except, we could terraform it into a green new world. But to solve the planet's problems, we first need to make it worse and turn it into oceans of lava with gigantic lasers. The <laughs> Interesting idea. <laughs> I love their animations. <laughs> Isn't a far-fetched science fiction tale. Terraforming Mars is possible on the kind of timescale our ancestors built great monuments in. If humanity solves some of its pressing problems and ventures into space to expand into the solar system, this may not be that far off. Hmm. Okay, so how do we terraform Mars quickly? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> Mars is dry and has no soil to grow anything. Its atmosphere is too thin to breathe or protect us from radiation, giving you a high risk of cancer. So to do That is true. Um, one of the things we take for granted on Earth is the magnetic field um, actually protects us from a lot of uh, cosmic radiation. Um, astronauts on the uh, International Space Station get considerably high doses than uh, people on the surface of the Earth. Uh, that includes uh, people who work in the uh, nuclear power industry. You'll even get higher than normal doses in the uh, stratosphere in, in an airplane compared to the nuclear power industry. Not a lot, nothing life-threatening, but just something to be aware of. ...into a new home for humanity, we have to give it a proper atmosphere similar to Earth's. It should be made of 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, and a tiny bit of CO2 at an average temperature of 14 degrees Celsius and under one bar of pressure. We have to create oceans and rivers, and then the ground has to be weathered into fertile soil to host living things. Then we need to install a... This looks like one of those many civilization world-building type games you see on your phone. I love it. <laughs> if only it were that simple. ...sphere on the surface and prevent it all from being undone by installing protective measures that can stand the test of time. It is difficult, but a big laser makes it a lot easier. Challenge 1. The Atmosphere some 4 billion years ago, Mars had a nice oxygen-rich atmosphere and was home to vast oceans and rivers. It held onto it for several hundred million years before it got blown away. Ultraviolet rays broke down mm. the atmospheric gases and then the oceans until they were swept away by solar wind. Today, Mars is a dry, barren wasteland. Luckily, a sizable portion of the water is frozen in deep reservoirs and in the polar ice caps, enough to create a very shallow ocean and enormous amounts of oxygen are bound as minerals in the Martian rocks, like the oxygen in the iron oxides that give the planet its rust red color, as well as carbon dioxide in carbonates. To free these gases, we need to reverse the reactions that lock them away by using thermolysis, which occurs at temperatures as high as on the surface of the sun. In short, we want to melt the surface of Mars. The best way to do that would be to put lasers in orbit, aiming their beams down on Mars. The most powerful laser today is the Eli MP, able to produce beams of 10 petawatts of power for a trillionth of a second. To melt. That's a lot. Um, petawatt, um, to get a sense of scale, a uh, gigawatt is about what a, a nuclear power plant uh, produces. 1,000 gigawatts go into a terawatt, 
and I believe a thousand terawatts go into a petawatt. So it's a lot of energy, but a very short period of time, whereas a nuclear power plant keeps you running constantly. Ours, oh, so we need a laser twice as powerful that runs continuously. The easiest way is to use a solar pumped laser that can be powered directly with sunlight. At its core are metal infused glass rods that absorb energy and release it as a laser beam. If we build an array of mirrors in space about 11 times the size of the United States, we can focus enough sunlight onto them to melt Mars. Let's do it. Interesting on that little diagram, I think they should get more sun, you know, having it on the other side of the planet and then reflecting it back if you're a little closer. Yeah. As the lasers hit the surface, about 750 kilograms of oxygen and some carbon dioxide emerge from every cubic meter of rock melted. If we are efficient, our lasers only need to melt through the top 8 meters of the surface to get enough oxygen. It would look terrifying. The skies would be shrouded in storms, <laughs> while the ground would glow red hot, crisscrossed by currents of lava. Tireless laser beams sweep over the landscape, leaving trails too bright to look at. After they pass, the ground cools quickly. A strange snow falls. The ashes from all the elements that solidify as they cool down, like silicon and iron. Mars is still a cold planet at this point. A happy side effect of this inferno is that all the water in the polar ice caps and even deep underground rises into the sky as hot steam, forming clouds that rain down over the entire planet. They would wash out the nastier gases from the atmosphere. I have to say, I just love the animation that they use in uh, showing uh, what this would theoretically look like. It's fascinating. Like chlorine, and carry away harmful elements that accumulated on the surface. In the end, they would form shallow oceans, saltier than on Earth. We might need to do an extra cleanup afterwards. It would take about 50 years of continuous lasering to create our oxygen atmosphere. We could use this opportunity to dig deeper in some places to create the basins for salty oceans or rivers and spare some landmark features like Olympus Mons and Valles Marineris. We're not done though. The resulting atmosphere is nearly 100% oxygen and only 0.2 bar. It's hard to breathe and very flammable. To make it similar to Earth and a lot safer, we need to add a lot of nitrogen, which Mars is sadly lacking. We have to import it. The ideal source is Titan, a large moon of Saturn, covered in a thick atmosphere that's almost entirely nitrogen. We just have to move 3,000 trillion tons from the outer solar system to Mars. While that's not easy, it is doable. To process that much of Titan's atmosphere, we have to construct giant automated factories on its surface, powered by our lasers, to suck in the atmosphere and compress it into a liquid. This gets pumped into bullet-shaped tanks, which are mapped. Factories powered by a laser. I guess just the energy induced by it. Okay. Driver shoots all the way to the red planet where they explode and mix with the oxygen. We've already been able to send individual missions to Saturn in just a few years. With enough resources, it should be possible to complete the task within two generations. Of course, it would be much more convenient to have nitrogen left over from terraforming Venus on the side. We explained this in detail in another video. So, about... It's good to know. Why not terraform multiple planets at once? Or kind of a... <laughs> They're doing this in a very stage-by-stage um, -stage approach, like a step-by-step, -step, almost like one of those YouTube how-to videos. <laughs> I guess it is one of those, but for something theoretical. But it would make more sense, um, just kind of each phase of your project, to uh, just like uh, with construction, to uh, have, say, something going on on Mars and a similar project going on on Venus that you can kind of pull resources with. A century after the start of the terraforming process, we have a breathable atmosphere that has the right gases. If the liberated CO2 isn't enough to warm it up to temperatures we can stand, we just add some super greenhouse gases. Mars at this point resembles a black marble from all the cooling lava, spotted with growing oceans and red patches where the old surface remains untouched. It's still a wasteland, no better than a desert on Earth. We need to fill it with life. Challenge 2. Biosphere. Installing a biosphere on a new planet is very difficult. Unexpected interactions between species or sudden diseases can destabilize it to the point of collapse. 
we would probably begin by seeding our young oceans with phytoplankton. Without competition, it would bloom rapidly, filling up the oceans to become the bottom of an aquatic food chain. They can be followed by tiny zooplankton, then by fish, maybe even sharks and whales. If things go well, life in the oceans will thrive. Life on land is harder. Plants need nutrient-filled ground to sink their roots into. One thing I'm not sure about, and it showed a bunch of um, terrestrial uh, life forms. Wonder how the lower gravity would affect things. Because gravity on Mars is about a third of that of the Earth. But most of the surface is the congealed remains of lava and ash. We could wait for thousands of years for water and wind to grind it down into finer sands, or try to do it manually. But we want to be quick, and we have a big laser. Turning the beam on and off in rapid succession would cause the ground to quickly heat up and contract, which breaks it into smaller and smaller pieces. Add a bit of water, and you get a sort of dark mud. Into this mud, we can mix fungi and nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They're able to absorb nitrogen and convert it into nitrate compounds to feed plants. The first plants we want to bring are native to volcanic islands on Earth, since they're perfectly suited to the laser-blasted Martian landscape. Makes Eventually, sense. the enriched mud becomes the foundation for grasslands and forests. In Mars's lower gravity, trees can become very tall very fast. Their roots gather the nutrients they need and... They're addressing the gravity right now. Good. Then dig deeper to turn more rocks into soil, forming a self-sustaining ecosystem. At this point, we can slowly introduce more plant varieties, insects, and animals. Not mosquitoes, though. The new... Yes. <laughs> Please don't bring mosquitoes to the next planet. <laughs> we have a chance to start over and build a planet from scratch. <laughs> or populate one, rather. The sphere needs to be maintained to prevent it from falling out of balance. <laughs> If plants grow too quickly and absorb too much carbon dioxide, the planet cools down too much. If key species die out, we could see populations collapse faster than they could recover. On Earth, other species would move in to fill the void, but our Martian biosphere is not as flexible. It takes hundreds, if not thousands of years before Mars becomes a stable environment. But eventually, the planet will have the potential to sustain large human colonies. With air, water, and food available, we can finally call Mars, black, blue, and green, our home. A giant volcanic island in space. Will it last, though? Challenge three, the long-term future. There is a problem we haven't addressed. Mars's core does not produce a magnetic field, so it doesn't have enough protection from solar radiation or cosmic. True. Ace. This becomes dangerous for the long-term health of Martian populations. So, as a final step, we need an artificial magnetic field. It doesn't have to be huge like Earth's. It just needs to deflect the solar wind enough so that it doesn't touch Mars. I love this animation. <laughs> just this big magnetic symbol. And of course, the radiation they're showing is green. Um, you haven't watched my videos before. Um, gamma radiation, cosmic radiation, no source of radiation is green. It's all invisible on that scale. The easiest way is to construct a magnetic umbrella far ahead of Mars that splashes the solar wind to the sides. A big superconducting ring powered by nuclear facilities is all it takes. It would orbit at the... I love how easy they said it was. It's all, all it takes. Um, I guess relative to uh, designing a new biosphere and all the crazy lasers and making a new ecosystem this one is probably easier than all of that other stuff just because you know you can put it in space and park it in a lagrange point it looks like is what they're going with a sun l1 point keeping it constantly in between the sun and mars and protect the new atmosphere and that's it terraforming mars would take some work hefty resources and probably a century or ten but it would be the first time we've lived in a home designed and shaped solely by us and for us a first step towards our future among the stars I like the detail of showing mars's tiny moons in the uh in the background there the first step that we can already take down here on earth is learning more about the physics and biology <laughs> all right now it gets to their advertising uh yeah that's um 
again, I love how they do did this video um, like a typical how-to video that's no different than how you build a shed in your backyard. <laughs> nice, nice high-level explanation. A um, couple of things they didn't address was the high gravity for humans on the surface of Mars. Are humans that are naturally going to be born on Mars going to be taller, but if they were to come to Earth, are they going to have to wear Earth suits to deal with the three times Martian gravity, um, which is what they're going to be used to growing up. Same thing for a lot of the uh, larger animals that they transplanted. I um, wonder what the long-term effect is on, um, of that lower gravity on a person. Interesting, they mentioned Venus. Venus's gravity is about 80 some odd percent of that of Earth, so it's going to be less of a concern there, but still something. Um, another thing they mentioned on that L1, um, for those of you who don't know Lagrange Point, think of it as kind of a parking spot in space um, relative to uh, Mars or whichever planet you're looking at that. Um, and the sun, um, any uh, space station um, you put there will be fixed relative to uh, Mars or whichever planet you're on rotating around the sun. It'll appear to be fixed, so it stays in step with the, uh, with the planet's orbital plane, if you will. So just think of it like that. But yeah, that was, that was fascinating. Um, thanks again for that recommendation. Um, please let me know what you thought about this in the project or, or in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.